Hey everybody, I'm Todd Gamblin from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And um, I'm gonna talk about how package managers can handle ABI incompatibility in C++. Um, the motivation for this is really that modern software relies on hundreds of dependency libraries. Um, if you look at some of the codes that we develop at the lab, um, even a small package like this finite element framework, MFEM, is something like 31 different packages in total with, with 69 different dependencies between them. And it gets it just gets bigger from there. Um, we have machine learning frameworks, um, like one of them is called LBAN. It has 71 different packages in it, 188 different dependencies. And the sort of bread and butter of um, the HPC work that we do at Livermore is multi-physics codes. And these things can get to be hundreds of packages um, with, with as many dependency links. And so managing software stacks like this is, is quite hard. Um, the, the rise of open source has really made reuse um, widespread. And so this is one of these Google Ngram viewer uh, plots of um, software dependencies over time. And you can see that it's, it's growing. Um, basically every modern language has some kind of package manager that enables you to reuse code easily. Um, our codes rely on tons of open source libraries, even the proprietary ones. And so if you look at this graph, um, it's showing that same code, it's called Aries. Um, and the red stuff is, is proprietary packages that we develop in house. And then the green stuff is open source that we rely on. Um, and so over 50% of the code is open source libraries. Um, since 2014, the number of libraries that this thing depends on has grown from around 60 to over hundred. And most of that is um, due to the complexity uh, required for GPUs and accelerators. Um, so we're really trying to support lots and lots of different hardware platforms, um, lots of abstraction layers, lots of different modules developed by different people and leverage open source at the same time. Um, and, and it can be pretty difficult. Um, the team struggles with updates, improvements and feature additions. So just do, handling an OS update and, and rejiggering the, the settings for this thing to, um, to build on a new OS can take you know, a day to a week um, to get everything compatible again. Um, if, if an OS updates underneath this at, at Livermore locally, um, it's, a, it's similar. Um, handling sort of Python dependencies and other languages under this uh, can take days. Um, CUDA updates are, are frequent and, and often require um, a rebuild. And so you know, the, the code is sort of constantly in, in churn. Um, and developers devote a whole lot of time to managing version and feature compatibilities between all the packages. Um, if you look outside of HPC, which is our field, um, dependencies are still the most frequent cause of build errors and software release delays. There's two studies um, that um, you can look at. One of them is, is a study from Google where they looked at 26, different, uh, 26 million different builds um, that were done internally and tried to analyze what exactly made the builds fail. And so they looked at both C++ and Java. And um, you know, the study clearly showed uh, that dependencies were, were the biggest uh, problem in terms of why builds failed and what had to be resolved. Um, type mismatches, syntax, semantic stuff, all the things that people spend time and tooling on um, were, were much less than, than issues working, working on issues with dependencies. Um, at ING, things were similar. There was a study about whether um, you know, releasing uh, fast or slow um, would, would help a team uh, reduce the number of uh, issues that they, that they faced um, doing releases. And um, dependencies were still the, the major culprit there, the, the top thing that people dealt with when, uh, that, that would delay a release. Um, and it didn't seem to change very much uh, depending on whether the team did rapid releases or non-rapid releases. It, it, it was regardless of the, the sort of workflow for the team. Um, dependencies were the, the top um, culprit for delaying releases. And they found that the, the result of this was that developers just avoid updates. Um, they, they don't want to deal with problems with dependencies. And so they keep around packages that have security vulnerabilities um, that don't perform as well as newer versions. Um, and the, you know, that, that causes the, pack, the, the code to stagnate. Um, and it gets harder and harder to upgrade the more you hold your dependencies back like this. Um, if you look at the JetBrains survey uh, from, from last year, uh, or I think this is this year, um, nearly three in four C++ projects are not using dependency management. And, and this is a pretty significant difference from other modern uh, language ecosystems. Um, essentially 50% of projects think it's easier 
um, to work to manage other people's code uh, along with their own, um, rather than leveraging some of the the major package managers that are out there for C++. So at least 21% of people are using a system package manager. So they're leveraging like their Linux distro, um, but only 9% are using VC package. 5% of people surveyed are using Conan. 1% are using build two. Um, and you know, I, I think this is, this is a, a testament to how hard it is um, to manage compatibility between C++ packages. So why can't we have nice package managers like all the other um, ecosystems? So like if you look at Rust, they have Cargo. If you look at Go, they have they have um, you know Go Get. They have uh, a module system. They have versioning. Um, they can easily fetch dependencies and build them with the project. Um, most package managers in those ecosystems assume that there's sort of a one-to-one -one relationship between source code and binaries um, on the platform. Um, so like your distro package manager has sort of one spec file that builds a portable binary um, for the package. And they try to make it as portable as possible um, so that it can work in lots of different places. Um, that's not great for performance. Um, and, and typically in, in the C++ world, we wanna build something that, that is performant um, on the target architecture. So, so portability is important too, um, but there are lots of different variants of builds that we, that we do. Um, the other assumption that's pretty common is that the tool chain is the same across the ecosystem. Um, that there's one compiler, one set of runtime libraries. Um, but the C++ ecosystem isn't always like this. Um, people want to build lots more variants and lots more different versions of things um, than, than typical package managers allow. And so if you look at the compatibility model um, that your typical package manager uses, it looks kind of like this. Um, it says, you know, what, what packages does this project depend on? Um, and, and what version of each package should I install? So you might have a package named foo, it's at version 1.0, um, it depends on bar and baz, and these have to be greater than or equal to 2.0 or 3.0. Um, and so you have some constraints, um, you have the dependencies that you need, um, and that's, that's pretty much it. Um, and for you know, JavaScript or for, for Go or for other, other ecosystems where there's sort of an ABI assumed, um, this is probably sufficient for determining whether your, your other packages are compatible. All you really have are API issues. Um, but C++ builds have way more parameters than this. Um, there are build configuration options that have to be managed. Um, there's optional features and interfaces. There's parallelism models. Um, there's in interfaces that have different implementations, um, different compilers, um, different microarchitecture targets. All of these things have to be dealt with. Um, in, in a C++ package manager. You have to have control over your target. You have to have control over the system runtime libraries. And so this simple package model um, turns into something much more complicated. Um, you have all this other metadata that you really want to track um, with the nodes in your graph. Um, and you, know, you, you want to track all of the things that are potentially ABI affected. Um, and so what is ABI? Um, there's, there's different kinds of incompatibilities between packages that, um, that, that can arise. API is your application programming interface. That's source level. And so that's the function names and types as written in the source. It's enforced at compile time. Your compiler will catch it. If you have an API problem, it's likely that it gets caught at compile time and you know, things just don't build. Um, incompatibilities fail fast. Um, things don't work. If you have ABI issues, um, it's things like calling conventions, it's function name mangling, it's data types and sizes, layout of structures, things that can change based on the, um, the language standard that you're using or the compiler that you're using or the libraries that you depend on. Um, and so if you get something like this, it may look like things fit at compile time, um, and it, but you may get failures at link time or worse, you may get really subtle errors at runtime because things have different sizes. So if you look um, you know, at, at the typical model um, in, in a package manager in, out in the wild, um, the model is pretty coarse. Um, the packages are names and versions. And so here you have A depending on B, depending on C. And then things like the runtime libraries, um, which are important for C++ and the bytes in terms of ABI are not really modeled. Um, so in, typically in a package manager, humans would define rules like this. They'd say A version 1.0 depends on B version 2.0. B 2.0 depends on C version three or four. Um, and, and these rules get updated by humans every time there's a new release. Um, the specification is not complete and the versions are sort of inexact. They, Semver um, is useful um, because if you adhere to the convention, um, you sort of bump the major version every time there's, um, every time you break the, uh, the API. 
Um, but packagers don't always adhere to that, or they don't know um, that certain things are going to affect their interface. Um, and so, you know, Semver at scale um, in large projects, it doesn't really scale. Um, you can get subtle errors uh, because of human error in the project. Um, the other thing that's that's missing from a lot of these models um, is there's not really a place for global constraints. So things like you must link with a you know with the C++ compiler if any of your dependencies use C++, or you need to use the Fortran compiler to link and supply the standard C++ library when you link if you if you depend on sort of language interrupt things. Um, there's there's not a lot of that modeled in current package ecosystems. Um, there and. So the, the, the model is pretty, is not sufficient. Um, if you look at library ABIs, um, they're much finer grained uh, than the version information that we currently have. So um, what really determines your interface <coughs> is the actual libraries and the functions that they, that they call um, and the data types that are defined in their dependencies. And so if you had a full model, it would cover entry calls, exit calls, data definitions in the libraries, um, and, and the, the usage of these types um, across the full dependency graph, as well as the runtime libraries. And so if you look at this, if you look at this model, it lets us answer more questions um, about the dependency relationships. So um, here's, for example, you know, if you have B here in this graph, um, and suppose that you redefine um, T3 here um, in, in library C, um, only B uses T3, it's private. And so if, if B is depending on C here, the only package that you really do need to rebuild here is B um, because nothing else is leaking out to A. Um, B is only using T3 internally. Or similarly, if you had say a change in the runtime library um, and you had a model like this that had all of the different um, function calls and types, um, you could look deeper and say, okay, if T1 changes in the C++ runtime library, um, then I have to do a lot more work. I have to rebuild the whole stack um, because everything is using T1, um, except for maybe this call over here. Um, so to really model ABI, you need a much deeper model um, of, of, the, uh, of the relationships between the libraries in your stack. Um, what most systems do to deal with dependencies like this um, is there's, a, there's three different ways. And you can get this out of um, Titus Winner's uh, software engineering book. There's a whole section on dependency management. And he outlines um, three different key ways that people deal with dependencies. So one of them is a bundled distribution. And this is like your Linux distro, um, where it's a curated set of packages um, that are all mutually compatible. And you're, you're sort of guaranteed that by the distro maintainers. Every, uh, you can look at Red Hat, it comes with binary compatibility information. There's a whole page you can look at that says, you know, how are the different components of this Linux distro expected to you know, remain compatible over time? If I build an application against these things, which interfaces can I rely on? Um, and so it's very stable, um, but the cons are that you, you have, it's a lack of flexibility. You have to make sure that your packages are compatible with exactly what's in the distro. And I think people who've used things like Red Hat and CentOS have seen that you know, versions get old sometimes. Um, the other thing that's that's taken off in, in the C++ world is, is live at head. And this is the sort of mono repo design um, that Google, Facebook, and Twitter would use, um, where you would put everything in one repository. Um, you The developers test the changes with all their dependents. Things rebuild every time you check in the repository. There's lots of updates. Um, it remains stable, but it, it hasn't really been shown to scale beyond a single organization. Um, and there's a really high cost of testing there. Um, the, the thing that Live at Head does that's useful um, is that it pushes dependency management and, and management of compatibility between libraries out to the, um, to the, to the people committing to the repo. So if you want to check something in um, and you have a mono repo where you're only allowing one version of everything, it's your responsibility to make sure that your changes aren't breaking everyone else um, and to make sure that, um, you know, you, that, that you're compatible with what's in the repo. Um, the, the problem with that is that it's a lot of work. So as you scale this out, that's more and more things that each person who, who commits a change is going to have to deal with. Um, and eventually, you know, they're not going to be able to modify, they're, they're not going to be able to make large changes. Um, if something becomes really foundational in the stack, it sort of stagnates. Um, 
Semantic versioning, or you know, just versioning, because um, a lot of the systems don't don't have purely semantic versioning, um, is what most of the package manager systems use. There's there are versioned packages. Um, there's some sort of you know um, convention for um, for versioning them, and there are constraints. And so the packages say, you know, I, at this version, I'm compatible with these versions of my dependencies. Um, and with that specification, um, it's not as as fixed, you know, it, as the other two um, distributions. It's not it's not necessarily curated the same way. Um, but you know, you're, you're relying on the constraints to find you uh, um, a compatible set of libraries. Um, And so the pros of, of the package management approach um, with, with solving are that you can make frequent updates. Um, it really only relies on um, you know, local information to each package. You don't have to get information about the whole ecosystem. Um, it works in theory, but like I said, um, at scale, semantic versioning breaks down. Um, the versions are overly coarse. Um, developers can over constrain or over promise um, and, and the errors start to dominate at scale. And so all these approaches have serious drawbacks. Um, and there's a lot of trade-offs between stability, frequent updates, and uh, you know, version and config flexibility. Developers like to have control, um, but they also want everything to work, um, and those two things are at odds. All right, so how can package managers help? Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, VC Package and Conan. Um, I'm actually the, the developer of SPAC, um, which is another package manager. It's used pretty widely in HPC, but not so widely within the C++ community. Um, but I wanted to compare um, how, how SPAC managed API compatibility with how VC Package and Conan did, and try to see if there were any common themes with how the systems worked. Um, because it, it, C++ is actually pretty similar to HPC in that all the, you know, the, the features of packages that I mentioned earlier are actually true for C++ and for HPC. We care about lots of different versions and configuration options. We build from source frequently. Um, and you know, we, we have lots of different language dependencies that are not necessarily our own. So we, you know, C++ codes often don't just depend on C++ libraries. So just what is a package manager? Um, the package manager doesn't replace your build system. I I've heard people um, you know, say this. So what, what about CMake? Why don't I just use CMake as my package manager? Um, CMake is really built to manage you know, one project. And yes, there's things like fetch content. There, there, uh, there are ways to pull in dependencies with CMake. Um, but they, if you use CMake to do that, what you're really doing is, is you're pulling in sort of fixed versions of your dependencies that you specified and you're downloading them. Um, and building them with your with your code. Um, a package manager is doing something for a whole ecosystem. It's managing dependency relationships between a, a much wider range of versions. Um, it's fetching the artifacts to build, um, and it's driving the package level build systems to make sure um, that they come up with a correct build in the end, um, that, that everything is, is compatible. Um, and so you know, they, they drive a high-level build system or, or a low-level build system. Like a high-level build system would be CMake or AutoTools, where it's really handling library abstractions. It's managing the sources that go into targets. It's dealing with the subtleties of how shared libraries are implemented on a particular system. And in a low-level build system, you know, these, these are generated by CMake and AutoTools, or things like Make and Ninja, where you're handling dependencies among commands and files um, in a build. The package manager is sort of meant to bring all these different projects together and um, enable you to create you know, your own sort of mini distribution of, um, of, of packages that actually work together. Um, all right. So um, the, the, the number of build systems that exist in the C++ ecosystem make that pretty difficult. Um, so CMake is the de facto standard. It's growing. It grows every year. It's still only 53% of projects. And these, these other systems are, are probably not going away. Um, they, a lot of them are older projects that maybe aren't going to change their build system. They sit at the bottom of the stack, um, and they tend to use things like auto tools and just raw make files. Um, and you know, like I said, C++ projects tend to depend on packages written in other languages, so like C and Fortran. Um, those things have their own build systems. And so making um, a package manager with sort of a unified build system just for C++ um, packages sort of rules out a lot of the other, um, of the other things that we depend on. Um, and getting all these options to work together across build systems is hard. Um, you can't really do it by hand for large projects. So all three of Conan, VC Package, and SPAC are really built to drive these lower level build systems. 
Um, and you know, if you, if you watch Robert Shoemaker's talk from a previous um, CPP con, and he says, write packageable software, um, don't package your, your software. And what he means by that is, you know, if you do adhere to conventions like CMake and Auto Tools, um, things that people understand well, um, it's going to be easier for the package manager to, to drive these build systems in a consistent way. Um, and so, you know, don't do your own custom build system. Um, it, 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 it hurts and it, and it makes it very hard for, for a package manager to sort of adapt to every package that has its own thing. And so, you know, you, you can think of the package manager as basically calling CMake with the right options um, for a particular package, pointing it at its dependencies, um, building that and installing it someplace so that the user can actually use it. Um, same for auto tools. It runs configure with the right options. It installs that, it builds the thing and installs it in a consistent way with everything else in the stack. Um, and it has to do that for all these build systems. So the other way that a package manager enforces consistency um, is by solving for versions. You have to select um, a set of versions that are you know, API and ABI compatible um, to put together in a graph. Um, and I think people forget this aspect of package managers sometimes. Um, the, I think most people, if you ask them, um, if, if they hadn't had a lot of experience with package managers, would probably say, oh, it just it downloads my dependencies and installs them. What's hard about that? Um, this is really the core of package managers that, that is hard. Um, this is the place where compatibility gets managed. Um, the solver in the package manager, whether it's you know, an ad hoc one or a complete you know, stat solver, um, has to understand all the dependency relationships between packages and pick a set of versions for all of them um, that work together. And so if you have, say, A depends on B and A depends on C like this, um, and uh, you know, B and C have dependencies on, on D, that are incompatible, um, then, then things aren't gonna work. Essentially B can depend on D version one. It cannot depend on uh, D version two. And C can depend on D version, C version two, um, but not version one. And so um, with that setup, um, you could never pick a version of D that satisfies at least these two particular um, versions of B and C. Um, it's, and so that's what makes it an NP complete problem. To solve this, you'd have to back out. You have to pick a different version of B or a different version of C um, and keep backtracking um, until you can solve the whole system. Um, if you think of a more complex example, um, you know, this, the, the previous one was pretty trivial. It's just you know, four packages. Um, but solving that for a system like this, um, where you, know, you have 70 plus packages, is way more complicated. Um, in this instance, one of our teams needed a new version of Keras. Um, it turns out that that needs a new version of Theano, which needs a new version of NumPy, which needs a new version of OpenBloss. And if you look at that relationship in this plot, I mean, it's hard to even find them, um, but you have to consider this the subdag um, where all of those packages live. If you pull that out, um, you can see that this is a root package here. They wanted to upgrade this one. Um, it depended on all of these things down to OpenBloss. And they had to figure out a version of OpenBloss that was compatible with these three other dependencies. So not just the one that NumPy needs, um, there's some constraint here, but also the constraints from Gromax and SciPy and Vice. And so you're really trying to make this whole thing consistent. Um, and you, if you pick one of the versions that NumPy is compatible with, it may not be compatible with some of these. So there's a sort of combinatorial search that goes on. Um, Doing this manually, um, where these constraints weren't really known for a Power9 machine at, at Livermore, it took about 36 person hours to, to, to get this working. And so, you know, this, this kind of stuff um, consumes a lot of time. Um, and it's not, NP hard problems are not really the thing that, that humans should be doing manually. Um, so the simplest way to enforce consistency, um, ABI consistency across your stack um, is, is to build everything from source. Um, and, and so uh, in this example, this would be Zlib, sorry about that. Um, you, you would build these three packages. You'd build Zlib first, um, you'd build mpitch with that Zlib, um, and then you'd build HDF5 on top of that. Um, and so if, if you build every one of these packages with a consistent um, with, with a consistent API, with the same compiler, with the same flags, um, you're gonna get a consistent build in the end. Now, if what, what comes up, um, in, in distro package managers um, is that they don't do this. And so your typical Linux distro um, doesn't actually adhere to this, this sort of pure source build model. Um, instead, um, the packages get built in a build farm. Um, and so you might build something like this originally. Um, and they can be deployed with dependencies that they were not built with. And so you may build you know, these, this, this Zlib, this mpitch, and this HDF5 
Um, and then somewhere else in the build farm, you might build another mpitch and another zlib over here. So this is a second build. Um, when the user goes to deploy something with the package manager, it may search and it may mix and match these packages um, in, in a way that doesn't preserve the relationships that were present when they were built. And so instead of HDF5, you might get that same package. So this is the same HDF5 here that was built here, but without the mpitch and zlib it was built with and deployed against the mpitch and zlib that, uh, that were built separately. And so you've got sort of a spliced dependency model um, where you have you could potentially have mixed ABI here. Um, the distributions don't tend to, uh, they, they tend to solve this by making these ABI decisions up front. So this gets back to that sort of bundled distribution model um, that we were talking about before, um, where essentially there's, there's this walled ecosystem where everything has to be built the same way. Um, packages can't really deviate from the distro ABI and you validate it. So like, for example, Red Hat validates their distributions with Lib Abigail, which is an ABI analyzer. Um, and that, you know, that, that makes the package versions more fungible. Um, you don't have to rebuild as much, but it actually makes the solve harder because there's more combinations of things that you can put together. Um, and it makes it easy, uh, it, it makes it easy to, to lose ABI compatibility if you, if you get this check wrong. Um, and so for, for sort of a, to, to, to ensure that a, a language package manager remains stable, um, you know, this, this is a lot of curation. And if you have a distributed system, you're not going to be able to, you know, check every combination of, of, um, of packages with something like libabigail. Um, C++ package managers do that sort of similar solve, um, but they, they fill in uh, the graph during dependency resolution um, with all of the extra metadata that we're talking about. So in Conan um, and uh, VC package and spec, I'll do this. Um, they have some build specification that comes from maybe config files um, that says, you know, build MPI leaks with these dependencies and these constraints. You get sort of a partially constrained graph. Um, you fill in all the details there. So you set the compiler, you set the, the, um, the, the versions, you set the architecture on those, um, on those specs, and you store the provenance off somewhere. Um, and when you have a graph like this um, with all of that metadata on it, um, the way that at least VC package and spec um, enforce um, this sort of as from source model um, is they hash the whole thing. And so every package in this graph is given a hash. Um, so so libelf would have its own hash of its metadata. Libdwarf would have a hash that includes its metadata and libelf's metadata. Dynance would have a hash that includes all of its dependencies metadata transitively. And you'd produce a hash and you know maybe they get all they all get installed to their own directory somewhere. Um, but essentially this Merkle hashing is, is how um, each package in the graph is given an identifier that sort of, that encapsulates its API information. Um, and the, the cool thing about that is that, that with these two systems, if, if you want to use binary caches um, to avoid building all the time, um, they both support it. Um, and it's implemented as sort of an optimization on top of source builds. Um, you have to have a hash that matches the hash that, that you got when you built. And so you can build a bunch of packages, you can stick them off somewhere, and you can redeploy them um, by just matching the hashes. So you deploy essentially the same way that you built uh, with this model. Um, interestingly, Conan does something different. Um, and it allows some more ABI mixing than maybe VC package and spec do. Um, Conan lets you, lets you customize what they call a package ID, which is really a hash, just like the other ones. Well, not, not just like the other ones, but similar. Um, and, and the package ID defines what can be matched. So that, that much is the same. Um, but um, the scope of the package ID is, is smaller. Um, so by default in Conan, um, the package ID really only includes the package and its direct dependencies. So for Dynance, it would only include libdwarf and libelf, but if these had transitive dependencies, so deeper ones that might affect the ABI, um, it wouldn't include them, it would omit that. Um, and so they, they sort of throw out the, the deeper dependency information um, to avoid the situation where like, maybe I changed libelf and I don't wanna have to rebuild literally everything in this graph. Um, Conan lets me, you know, it, it would let me customize that upfront um, by setting a certain package ID mode and, and saying how the hashing is done. Um, the tricky thing about that is that it's, it's a lot of flexibility and um, it's, it's all put sort of on the user. Um, so the user can customize the package ID, but there's like 12 of them. And so you can choose whether you want to consider the major mode, or the, the major version, the minor version, the patch version, and the semver, 
um, whether you want to include direct dependencies or the full uh, the full package recipe in your hash. Um, you can choose all of this um, for your own local ecosystem. And um, when you build stuff with Conan, um, you know this is this is how it does reuse. Um, the, the interesting thing about this is that Conan Central actually uses the sort of semver direct mode. That's the default one. And so if you want to consume packages that come from there, um, you have to use the same package ID that they do. So you really only have one option for, for using the public binaries. But if you want to customize it locally, um, you can do that. Um, and they even let you customize um, the ABI compatibility information per package. So um, in, in one package, if, if you have a package that you really want to be modeled the same way uh, or considered compatible, if it was built with four, GCC 4.5 or 4.6, you can sort of override the way that it does hashing um, and ensure that the, the hash is basically, it's hashing the same thing for both of those compilers. Um, and so you can actually do this for every package in your, in your graph. Um, so, you know, that's useful for sort of poking holes um, in the compatibility system, but it seems like this is, it's, it's difficult, that it would be difficult to manage a really large ecosystem with this, um, with this sort of package ID customization. Um, what they say that this is used for um, is um, ensuring that you don't do as many builds in CI. So it's sort of a trade-off. You, you make the package ID coarser and you don't have to rebuild as often, but you may get ABI incompatibilities injected in your stack. Um, and the, the default uh, package ID um, sort of leaves you open to that because it's only considering direct dependencies and not a lot of options on them. Um, but if you want to, you know, if you want to reuse the Conan Central packages, you have to use this one. So you may you may find that um, some deep dependency is affecting your ABI in a strange way. Um, but it does let you make your CI faster. Um, if you compare that to SPAC and VC package, um, where they're really modeling the whole graph um, and they're they're very conservative. Um, they're going to make you rebuild everything and sort of ensure that that the stack um, is working um, with a with a finer grade hash. Um, and so, the the binary reuse, the way that these systems assess ABI compatibility right now, um, is that they do this hash match, um, and and the process is ordered. So um, what. What they all do first um, is they, they resolve their dependencies. They come up by looking at, at the, um, the package recipes and the user constraints um, with a configuration for the graph. Um, they, they then take the hashes that they get from that and they look in the remote cache to try to find a match. Um, and they pull the packages if it's an exact match. Um, and so what, what that means, and this is kind of subtle, um, is that to consume some binary, you kind of have to recreate all of the metadata that goes along with it, um, which is good, I mean, because it's conservative, you know what you're getting, um, but it doesn't leave a lot of room uh, for ABI uh, for, for um, you know, picking a compatible package, reusing a package that you could reuse that wasn't built quite the same way um, as you built. Um, and so it can be difficult to get good reuse if you're not operating from say the same commit as, as the remote uh, build cache was built with um, in these systems. So, you know, ideally, um, I think the conservatism is good because it's hard to model ABI, but ideally you'd like to go deeper um, and, and be able to consume more pre-built binaries and more builds um, and store provenance for that. And um, so, you know, one use case for that is if an OS update happens underneath your stack, like we had at, um, at Livermore, you'd really like to know what changed by looking at the binaries ABI on the system and understanding um, what's compatible and what's not um, with your with your build configurations, and this is really hard because you have to go and inspect binaries. Um, if if information is not available, you'd really like to be able to extrapolate it. And this is even harder because you would have to know sort of you know a, looking at a binary, um, you know what version might it be if you, you could check Summit or, or go look that up somewhere. But it, there, there's no database right now that has this kind of information. Um, but you know, if, if you had a registry um, or, or some database of, of package information from the package manager, um, you could look at, you know, a, a user requirement change. So say they upgrade a version um, and, and know which packages need to change to meet the new requirements and identify existing binaries that are actually compatible. And, and what I mean by this is not compare by exact hash, um, but look deeper, compare the compilers that things were built with, compare based on the metadata instead of doing this sort of hash match. And, and solve to, to find a set of binaries that are compatible based on semantics and not based on sort of hashing metadata. Um, and you know, I'm gonna talk about what, we, what we're doing in SPAC to try to make this possible. Um, 
So you know, one place where this is useful is you'd like to know um, about things that are, you know, if you built one package with, with one particular compiler, say you built this package with the Intel compiler and it used um, G++, G++ is old libs dead C++. Um, and you want to do another build on top of that. Say you want to build this package with this one and you're using a newer version of the compiler. You know, this is the, the libs dead C++ ABI change. A lot of people got bitten by this because we had installed packages um, that we're using the old libs dead C++. We have both compilers on the system. Um, and people would build new packages on top of them that were built with the new API. And so, you know, that, because they were using a newer version of GCC. Um, and so this is binary incompatible. Um, if you had this kind of information, if you had sort of the full provenance of this the, and the runtime libraries associated with it, um, you could compare these things and say, oh, okay, well, if I link these two things together, I don't just have one uh, version of this runtime library in my DAG, I have two. And so I have sort of an, you know, an ODR violation because I have two versions of the, of the standard library that are implemented differently or that have different versions. Um, we'd like to be able to solve for something like this or at least to tell this guy that you, know, you can't build with that package. Um, right now, that's kind of on you. Um, you if, you're, if you're using one of these systems and you point at um, you know, some, some uh, some binary that you want to build with. Um, so in SPAC, um, we are trying to build a solver um, that, that can do this. That instead of um, you know, just doing hash matches for um, dependency resolution, that we would actually look at the metadata on the binaries. Um, and in SPAC, essentially the, the way that things work is there's contributors, they contribute to these package recipes. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of customizable config um, where you can express preferences about how you want things built. Um, so, you know, the, the default packages.yaml, um, it tells you, you know, what versions of things do you prefer? Um, what features do you want enabled on uh, the packages that you're building? Um, admins can customize that stuff. Users um, you can, uh, outside just the, the, the defaults, can customize it for their own builds. And you can set up environments that have even further customization. And then on the command line, when you install things, you can put constraints there too. So you can specify a version, you can specify features that you want enabled. All of this stuff gets lumped together into the dependency resolver. We call it the concretizer in stack. Um, and we spit out the sort of fully resolved graph at the end. And so if you look at the way that we implemented this originally, and this is actually sort of like how um, Conan implements this right now, um, and, and VC package actually implements a solver that uses something like what Go does for, for version resolution, where they're doing sort of um, minimal uh, version satisfaction. Um, we're trying to, we, we had a greedy solver like that initially, um, and, and we would get a lot of errors because we just have so much metadata in the graph. Um, we, we would have um, you know, packages where you would come up with a resolution for one node um, before, you, it, well, early, and then you would get to something that had a, a conflicting constraint on that node and it would say, oh, there's a conflict. Um, when really, if we had a backtracking solver um, that was complete, that explored all the options, um, we, we could solve it. So we get a lot of false negatives um, with, the old, with the old solver. Um, we looked at different SAT solving solutions for SPAC um, to try to get sort of this, this deeper metadata modeling that we want. Um, and, you know, we, we looked at PicoSAT, uh, which is just sort of a raw SAT solver. It's used by Conda. Um, this, it's good because it's complete. It's a full SAT solver, um, but it doesn't really have a lot of features on top of that. It doesn't do things like um, optimization. It, you have to sort of implement your own arithmetic and Boolean logic with it. Um, and it's, it's quite complicated to get working. And it's also um, slow, at least the way that Conda has implemented it. Um, there's a library called libsolve um, that's used in the distro package managers. So if you use APT or, or, um, or YAST or some of these tools, um, libsolve is pretty common in those, um, but it's, it's very targeted towards that traditional package model where you just have a name and a version and not extra compatibility information. Um, and it only optimizes for sort of recent versions or things like that. Um, it doesn't do sort of the tailored optimizations that we want where we might prefer, um, you know, to have things that are compatible for some other reason, like the compiler supports the target we're trying to build for, or, um, you know, we need um, a version of something with a particular option. We can't, there's no way to express those sorts of preferences with Libsolve. Um, and so we, we looked for something that had sort of better optimization. Um, we ended up implementing a new dependency resolver for SPAC in something called answer set programming, um, which it's, so we used a library called Klingo. It's a C++ library 
Um, and it, it implements this, um, it, it's, it's a solver, but you write the specification for it in something that looks a lot like Prolog. Um, it is not as complicated as Prolog because it just boils down to SAT and optimization on the back end. Um, and it doesn't really have all the sort of weird operational semantics that Prolog has, where you have to know all about the solving algorithm that Prolog is using. Um, with this, basically, you just write a declarative specification, and um, it makes all of these um, rules consistent. And, and the cool thing about it is that, you know, unlike our greedy solver before, it's not, um, there's no order to it. Um, you, you're basically solving all of the constraints at the same time. And it's finding a model that satisfies all of them, or maybe several models. Um, there may be lots of different uh, valid resolutions for a particular um, specification. Um, the solve time is way faster uh, than what we had before. I mean, because what we had before was in Python. This is this is a proper you know C plus plus library, but it's pretty impressively fast. It's using modern um, CDCL SAT techniques, and it does optimization. Um, and so you know the logic program, I think it's it's about five or six hundred lines now. Um, but it's way smaller than what we had before um, to do this kind of resolution. And we generate a bunch of facts. They look like this, where it says like, hey, this UCX package has this version and it's our top preference. This, it has this other version and it's our second preference. We generate all these facts, we throw them at the solver um, and it comes back with something that satisfies all of our constraints. Um, it made it very easy uh, to put the you know, declarative logic in one place. Um, and so you know, for constraints like you can only have one version of something in your graph, um, you basically say, hey, there's, you know, out of all the possible versions for a package that's in the graph, um, you can have one of them in, in your um, in your solve. That's what this first constraint means. It's saying there's a set, it has to have one member. It's the version PV from all the possible versions PV. Um, these come from facts from the input. Um, and, you know, if we, we can express minimization really easily too. Um, you can basically give every version a weight like you saw in the facts on the pre previous slide. And you can go and figure out, you can minimize the version weight to try to prefer recent versions, but you don't have to pick them. Um, and the solution will come back, you know, with, uh, it'll, it'll optimize for that criterion in the solution. Um, the cool thing about this that, that sort of differentiates it from other solvers, and it's really good for ABI resolution, um, is that it lets you do really complicated criteria um, simultaneously. So, you, Previously, we had some extremely complicated logic um, to go and look at all the available compilers, to look at all the available targets, like microarchitecture targets for a system. And we would go and look at you know, each compiler and say, okay, this one supports Skylake, this one supports Cascade Lake, this one supports these microarchitectures. Um, and we would try to pick the compiler um, that was compatible with all the packages in the graph, um, and that also supported the best optimization target um, for, for the code. Um, and or, or for the host machine that we were building for. And so um, the cool thing about ASP is that we can just optimize those at the same time. You can put this really concise specification in and say, okay, every node has a target. Um, you have to pick one. Um, you can say, I just can't use targets on a node if the compiler for the node doesn't support them. So if so basically we put these, we just put the facts about the compiler. We, for every compiler, we say compiler supports target, compiler version target. Um, and if it doesn't, um, and the node has that target, that's not allowed. This is basically saying not allowed. Um, and it, it basically, these are saying that this node was assigned this compiler in this version. Um, and so this is like a two line thing um, for what was previously a really nasty loop nest. Um, and you know, if the user overrides something and explicitly sets a target, we respect that. And then down here, um, we do another one of these minimizations that says just you know minimize uh, the the weight of all the targets. We give the better targets a, a you know a lower weight, and so it tends to prefer those. And you can mix this in um, with the version optimization that we showed on the previous slide. So basically, it's it's easy to define lots and lots of criteria. Um, so um, even with um, you know virtual packages. Um, which are basically interfaces that we support where essentially you can depend on say BLOSS and there's lots of impl implementations of BLOSS or you can depend on MPI or you can depend on the JPEG interface and there's like JPEG 2000, there's, there's different, there are different, there are JPEG Turbo and, and LibJPEG are two implementations of the J JPEG interface. You can depend on the interface and, and the tool will try to swap in sort of the best implementation of it. Um, implementing that was pretty concise as well for similar reasons. We can basically express it as an optimization problem um, and just give the solver the constraints and we'll pick the best configuration according to what we said. Um, not everything was simple. Um, ASPs, it's it's not 
you know, super difficult to learn, um, but it's, it's a fairly high learning curve and it's a different way of thinking. So if you haven't been exposed to this kind of stuff before, um, it can take a while to get in the right mindset for writing um, logic programs and, and solves like this. Um, it, it takes a lot of thought to write the different lines, but I mean, the, the cool thing about it is that you know, there, there's been a lot of research in this area of SAT solving um, and optimization in the past 10 or 20 years. And it really is fast. Um, it's able to solve large problems for us um, pretty quickly um, in you know, five, 10 seconds for, for things that used to take a really long time uh, for the Python solver, or that would, would take a long time if you wrote your own SAT solver. Um, and you know, there's a whole lot of um, optimization that's gone in this field. Um, structuring optimization criteria can be hard, um, and you know you have to sort of curtail it sometimes because it can be very aggressive. Unlike it's sort of an ad hoc solver, um, if you implement your dependency resolver this way to try to take advantage of you know all of the possible solutions, if there's something um, that that obeys the rules that you asked it to to obey, it will find it, and so that can be surprising sometimes. So for example. Um, Previously with the solver, we we tried to get it to, um, it wasn't smart enough to figure out that it had to turn on a, a feature option for HDF5 to depend on, on say, this, this, this library implementation. So we'd say, install HDF5 with this MPI implementation. This is just a dependency library. Um, this is only possible when a feature is enabled. And so we would have to write um, something like this, um, where we'd say, spec install HDF5 plus MPI um, with mpitch. Um, we can basically write this now, um, where we don't put um, the additional constraint in there, um, and the solver is smart enough to turn it on, um, but it can sometimes be pretty, it can be a little too smart. So if you say, well, install HDF5 without MPI, um, it figures out that indirectly HDF5 depends on libAEC and CMake and libarchive and lz4 and Valgrind has an MPI option, and it turns on the Valgrind MPI option and says, there, I got it in the graph for you. Um, and so it, it finds sort of strange configurations sometimes, and we have to add extra constraints to, to, to prevent that. Um, but the declarative specification is real nice for, for ABI stuff. Um, the other thing that it does um, is that it enables really major simplifications to the dependency specification. So if you have, say, some sort of cross-product dependency like this, where you depend on foo with these two options when you have these two options, um, you can sort of orthogonalize it and say, okay, I depend on this library and I should propagate um, you know, the capital A option when I have the lowercase a option. I should propagate the B option when I have the B option. Um, and one of the cooler things is um, for things like virtual packages where we're depending on an interface, we, we have a package that depends on blahs and can be built with lots of different providers, um, we can specialize it. So there's packages that say things like, I need, um, if, if I depend on open blahs and not Intel MKL, I want the OpenMP variant. And so now we can write, you know, when, if, if you choose open blahs for this provider, then turn on this option on that package. Um, and so specializations like this work too. Um, so the package can be built with any blahs provider, but when you choose this one, you get a few other options on it as well. Okay, so back to the original problem that we want to solve. Um, with this kind of logic solving, um, I, we are able to generate descriptions and solve on sort of any part of the package metadata. And so what that allows us to do um, for ABI compatibility um, is we can put an awful lot of metadata into the solve um, that, that tells us you know, what compiler it was built for, what target it was built for, what options were enabled on it, and so on. Um, and we can solve for all of that at the same time. And the specification for that is really, really short. Um, you can basically say, you know, for, for any installed hash, um, for a package, um, the solver is free to pick one. That's what this, this top thing says. It can pick an installed you know, hash. And we put this information into the solve about the installed packages. So this is basically saying there's a version of OpenSSL that we hashed this way. Um, and it had all of this metadata on it. Um, and so I now not only have the hash for an exact match, I have a whole bunch of other constraints that I can go and analyze at the same time. And so I don't have to just pick by exact match of a hash. I can say, okay, if all of my rules say that I'm compatible with the things that are installed, um, then I can reuse this package. And so um, we have sort of a generalized um, constraint mechanism where basically if you, we can say, if you pick this package with this hash, um, then impose all of these constraints um, from that installed version because you've picked a version that you can't really do anything with. You have to, you have to use it the way that it was installed. It's, it's pre-built. Um, and 
we can still um, you know, minimize the number of builds that we do. And um, it, it basically, we can have all the same preferences that we had for the built packages, um, but we can try to reuse as many installed hash packages as we can. And so ultimately what this does is it gives us ABI compatible builds um, for installed packages, um, but it, it's able to do it with a whole lot more reuse than what we had before. So if you try to install LLVM with the old solver, um, and here's all the criteria that we optimize for over here, um, you might reuse like one package. It's reusing the version of Zlib that it had, and everything else is going to have to be built um, in this configuration. So LLVM, CMake, and versus all this stuff is going to have to get built again. With the new solver, um, we're able to say, okay, we have some installed packages on the system. Um, they have you know, constraints on them that, that satisfy our requirements. And so we can plug them into the solve and verify that all the other ABI constraints are not you know, being violated. And so um, we're able to reuse a whole lot more packages here. Basically, we, we're just gonna build CMake, LLVM, and like Perl and package comps this time, um, as opposed to all the stuff that we were building before. Um, it's able to reuse you know, these, these other libraries and validate as part of the solve that they're compatible. So with this technology, um, what we are going to try to do is, is put even more detailed ABI information into the solver. And so as opposed to having you know, SEMVR constraints um, like other systems do, um, what we'd really like to have um, are detailed, is detailed ABI information that something like libabigail um, or you know, ABI laboratory might generate um, where you have information about those functions and types. Um, we're going to try to put that in the solver and see how it scales um, so that essentially we can solve not just on sort of human provided labels, um, but on the ground truth from at least the debug information from the binary um, so that we know what's compatible. And so we're hoping um, to take sort of this, this whole you know, uh, information, uh, this whole scheme for solving that we have where we have a reuse scheme for installed binaries and, and contribute to this new SG15 working group that's going on right now around um, you know, standardizing package metadata. Um, essentially, we, we want to specify um, what's required to consume pre-built binaries, what's required to evaluate whether they're compatible with what you're building or what you're reusing, um, and how do you put them all in the same build? Um, and I think we have, um, you know, at least a step towards that right now. It's a hard problem, um, but that's what we've done. So thanks. So I see one Q&A question, um, which is, um, so it's to be sure, new package is a semantic versioning type. Um, I, I think so. I think that's right. I actually don't know that much about um, new package. So um, I, I think it is. So it would, can you clarify what you mean by the solver is not on the package manager yet um, for SPAC? I guess I'll answer this live. So at least in SPAC, um, the, the solver is in the tip of develop and the release that's going to come out this week um, is going to have the solver in it. Um, so actually, if you if you just get clones back right now and try to run a solve, it's going to be using Klingo. It bootstraps it from a binary to start with, um, and then it does the solves from there. So yeah, it's in there. And then can it solve dependencies in non-C++ binaries? Yeah, it can. Um, so SPAC's not tied to C++. Um, it has about 6,000 packages in it from Python and Fortran and C and C++. It's, it's multi-language. It's sort of inspired by Nix um, in terms of the model that it uses for installation, but the solving is, is um, sort of our own thing on top of that. Um, Nix is sort of this sort of repo versioned thing where the, the package recipes move forward in the repo over time. But SPAC is solving sort of general recipes. They're templated and parameterized so that you have all this metadata. All right. All right. Um, so can SPAC differentiate between dependencies that don't require ABI and those that do? Um, sort of. So it, at the moment, the, the compiler model is restrictive in that we sort of assume that every package is going to have a compiler assigned to it. So like we know we, we, we have you know, a C compiler, a C++ compiler, and a Fortran compiler associated with every node. So it gets a little annoying because it sort of um, expands the number of Python packages that you have if they're pure Python. Um, but uh, th that's going to get removed in sort of the version after this one. Um, we're going to have a model um, where compilers are just proper dependencies that impose a runtime library dependency on the thing they build. Um, so maybe not completely right now, um, but um, eventually. So can it be used with C Sharp? Um, I don't think we have many C Sharp packages in SPAC. I don't think there's much of an ecosystem there yet, um, but it, it would be interesting to try. 
I, I think it would, you know, there's some Java packages in there, um, which would be similar. Um, although I don't know that we're modeling all of the concerns that you would have for dependencies in those ecosystems. So I think that would, it, it'd be cool to talk about that. Um, it's this one live. Is SPAC able to detect unexpected problems with a binary that might crash the application? How does it deal with missing symbols? Um, so we don't have symbol level stuff yet. Um, right now we're just doing the solve that I showed where we're just, we're looking deeper at the metadata and we're solving more than just names and versions in, in the solve. We're looking at compilers, compiler names, build options. You can have a dependency on a build option. We're looking at microarchitecture targets and things like that. Um, ultimately, yeah, we would, we would like to be able to solve um, and do sort of duct typing on the symbols um, that we get out of the dwarf and say, okay, you know, here's here's the debug information for this package. Here's the debug information for this package. Look at the exit calls and see that they match up with the entry calls. That's what this research project is about. Um, so not yet. Um, it's a long-term project, but we, we sort of hope so. And I think, you know, yeah, Conan has that problem. We have that problem right now. I think the, the ABI compatibility for runtime libraries is a problem that pretty much every package manager has, unless you stick to that sort of strict source built model um, that, that these things use by default. All right, and um, answer live, is it cross-platform? So SPAC has historically been just for Mac OS and um, for, uh, for Linux. But um, we actually, the, the PR went in this week to give it initial support for Windows. Um, it's probably pretty rough um, and the packages probably don't work as well there. Um, but we really are um, trying to make it work for Windows and, and trying to make it completely cross-platform. So thanks. Any other questions? So that's so. This is an interesting question. In a Windows environment where DLLs can be shared, have you ever seen a solution that would vet out multiple executables you create that are not statically linking their libraries? Um, yeah. So we've thought about that, and actually, the the Windows support that I mentioned was developed by Kitware and TechX. And um, Brad King at Kitware came up with a pretty cool idea for how we could emulate something like RPath on Windows. And basically, um, you know, we we've thought about doing this on Linux actually. Um, in your binary, um, where you would typically have an SO name or like a DLL name, um, you can actually put an absolute path there. And it seems like both LD.SO and the Linux link or the, the Windows um, loader will respect that if it's in the binary. The interesting thing is that uh, at least on, uh, on, on neither side, um, does it seem like it's possible to get you know, a compiler to stick an absolute path in there. And so what you end up with if you if you pass an absolute path to a library is still that sort of the DLL name and, um, and it has to be resolved in the normal Windows way. Um, but if you hack the lib file for the library, which is what Brad came up with, um, you can stick an absolute path there and get the, um, the, the linker to produce a binary that has an absolute path to some library in a weird location. And so we're hoping to use that um, to sort of allow us back to use binaries in different locations on, on Windows without having to contort the model to do the sort of dump the DLLs next to the executable or link statically thing. So thanks. Any 